Hi everyone. Hi, um, my name is Ellen and I'm currently an intern here at Ilham Gallery. And I just want to say thank you for coming to, the, to today's talk on Animation Malaysia, traditional art and contemporary painting as inspiration. It is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Hassan Abdul Mutalib, for, uh, famously known as Malaysia's father of animation. Hassan is a self-taught artist, designer, and filmmaker who has been involved with the animation and film industry in Malaysia for over 50 years. Uh, perhaps you know him for having directed the popular Sang Kanchil series that was screened on RTM in the 80s. He has also recently won the Medeka Award for being the pioneer and earliest influence in the local animation world. Today, he will be screening a selection of animation clips from Malaysia and all around the world in order to demonstrate the influence of traditional art and music in modern animation. Please join me in welcoming Hassan, Hassan Abdul Mutalib. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, father of Malaysian animation means I am very old. <laughs> 73 to be exact this year. So the back is not working very well, so I may have to sit for a short while. And I also have to drink from time to time teh tare with honey because I have a sore throat after giving 14 talks in the last one and a half months all over Malaysia. Okay, uh, okay there we are. <clears throat> so I must say that uh, I'm not, uh, I've never been trained in, in all the things I've been done, <coughs> I've been doing, uh, which means I'm here under false pretenses, maybe. So uh, I never studied art history, never studied animation and so on, but because I just love I happened to get into it and I loved it and so I decided to learn on my own and in the end I ended up being also being called an academic even though I've never been to university. Why? Because I copied people the way they write and it worked. So I think that is one of the ways they, uh, they say that you learn things by copying how other people do things and uh, also through trial and error and uh, also through thinking. I was not very good at learning from people, especially in school. And I feel my Form 5 exams with horrible results. But my English was always distinction. And uh, that actually has helped me in be, being able to read and understand uh, <coughs> the books that uh, you know, I've been going into. So the, this is actually an expanded version of a paper that I presented at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore last year. Uh, I was uh, one of five people who were invited from all over Asia. So I've expanded it a bit uh, to give you an idea of what are the directions we should be taking for animation. Let me see if I get this right. Okay, this is what I'm going to be talking about. And uh, details about the history you can read in my book. This took me 20 years of compiling, eight years of writing, and it's the only book on Malaysian animation history. And I was able, in fact, I'm the only one who knows the history because I worked with some of the pioneers. I knew some of them and uh, I managed to interview a few of them even though I didn't know I was going to write a book. So that happened because I was lecturing since 1976. And at that time, I was still learning animation. So I decided uh, to put a couple of things in writing uh, so that I can talk to my students about a little bit about the history. <clears throat> and uh, the first films ever made in Asia, so these are the films uh, from Thailand to China to Malaysia, India, and so on. And we hold the record in Malaysia for having done 15 feature films and more than 500 animation TV series. And I was involved at the very beginning in the start of the TV animation industry. And I also directed the first uh, animated feature film, which is uh, this one, uh, Silat Legenda, which I'll be talk talking about more. And this is where animation in Malaysia started. Uh, you may not recognize the place now. Uh, if you go along Jalan Ma'arof to Bangsa, 
you will see an uh, Indian temple, isn't it? On your left side. Behind that was this building. This is where they made a lot of documentary films during the British times under the Malayan Film Unit. This was taken in 1963. So it began in 1946 <clears throat> and then um, set up by the British and they made propaganda films. So we never heard what the people who were photographed were actually saying. We only heard this voice of God telling us about everything that was going on. So here clearly, uh, uh, was it Benedict Anderson who talked about the imagined community? So they showed an imagined community coming together to rebuild the nation. And it worked. Very fascinating. I've seen many of the films uh, since I started working there. So the first animation ever done was for a documentary film called The Kinta Story in 1949. So the first animation was stop frame animation, where you put objects in front of the camera, you move it a little bit, take it frame by frame. We call that stop frame animation. And that is the camera that they were using. The camera was originally in Sri Lanka and brought over to Singapore, from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur. And uh, the man standing up there is Mohammad Zain Hussein, who was the, one of the director generals of the Malayan Film Unit. And he later became my mentor, an incredible man. And this is the first animated short film ever made in Malaysia. It was called The Tale of the Mouse Deer. And it took about 18 years to complete. Uh, it was, that was because only one man was working on it, and he was not even an animator. He was just a uh, set designer and doing titling. And they asked him during his free time to make this film. So somebody got this book, which was published in 1938 in London. It was a compilation of oral stories from the village about the mouse deer. And you know the mouse deer, the stories are very indigenous, not only to Malaysia, but also to Singapore, to the Philippines, to uh, Brunei and Indonesia. And in uh, the Philippines, they call it uh, Si Plando. Plando means deer in Malay. And uh, finally, it was completed in 1978. And unfortunately, it was not screened until 1983. And that's when the, the history actually began not only for the industry, but also for me. Because I had just been promoted to be the head of design, and I did not know anything about animation. We had a new minister of information and a new director general, and they saw this one, they thought we had made it. So I couldn't very well say, sorry sir, I don't know how to do animation. Because I had just been promoted, isn't it? <laughs> so I crossed my finger, I said, no problem. So we made the second one, and it became a huge hit, it made my name until today, people remember all the dialogue in the film. So that was quite amazing because when I was doing it, I didn't know what we were doing and we were scared stiff and the minister was breathing down my neck. Then I did the second one, uh, the mouse deer and the crocodiles. So also taken from that, the same book, but I modified it and I put the animation elements, humor and so on, which was not there for the first one. <clears throat> so, these are some stills from the first one that I did, the mouse deer and the monkey. And uh, uh, I can tell you one of the reasons why it is still popular today. This is because of the film language that I used. And this is something that 95% of Malaysia's film directors do not understand. And there is no book in the world that actually tells you about film language. So, watch Hollywood movies or any movie for that matter. If you have a light coming from above falling on someone, it means that person is of a spiritual disposition. And the story is, uh, has got some kind of a moral uh, message to it. And uh, when there's a lot of greenery, uh, bright green, yellow, flowers and so on, everything is positive. So it relates to the character. We call this association. And then my first scene is very yellowish because the sun is rising. In a film, if you have yellow element dominating, it means the story has got something to do with spirituality. So this is what goes on into the subconscious mind. You don't have really have to know about the theories behind it. Then when I did the second one, this was more a TV version. And I said, why don't we make the sky yellow, the crocodiles blue? Let's see what people say. Nobody said anything. They enjoyed it. So 
and then I took Aesop's Fables. I got the uh, Aragon Rabbit animated, changed it around, and uh, a couple more. Then later, when in 1994, <coughs> Usopp Sontorian, a pilot episode, was sent to the TV station RTM and also sang Vira. So I happened to be the only expert at the time on animation. So I was called, I was on the panel, and we gave the go-ahead. And so the animation industry started, the TV animation industry. So Usopp Sontorian was very unusual because we uh, drew by hand on paper. Then uh, we had a plastic sheet on top. We did the outline in ink, turn it over, and then we paint on the back. That's the traditional method. But this group of people, they knew they could not do things the way that we did because it would take them years to, to learn. So uh, coincidentally, t uh, uh, digital technology happened to come in. And then they had this very low-end software called Animator Pro, and they drew with the mouse. So they had one drawing, they went over it, and then they manipulated it. Uh, I don't know how, I uh, can't get the hang of it. And then they were able to do animation. At the beginning, it was not so good. But then they became better and better. Mm -hmm. right. Then, of course, uh, our very famous cartoonist, Dato Lat, uh, they knew he was just waiting to be animated. And so Astro, the, TV, the satellite station, came in and they spent, you know how much? 800,000 ringgit per half hour episode. And RTM is only paying 45,000 per episode to our local producers. So they had a Hollywood company coming into the picture to plan and develop the story. And the animation was done in Philippines and the post-production was done in uh, Vietnam. So that's why it costs a lot of money. And that's the way to go. So this is uh, some stills from the animated feature film that I had done. <clears throat> and what we did was we took a story, uh, we referred to the stories of uh, ancient Malacca, the 15th century, about Hang Tua, the five legendary warriors. And they became generic names for five schoolboys. They adopted that name, and then they became superheroes. So it was actually not my story. I wouldn't have done something like that. So it became Power Rangers, malicious Power Rangers. So I was called in to direct. They had already had the rough storyline, uh, character design done. And the characters were very anime, so we modified it a bit. And uh, it starts with a four-minute prologue. And then it comes into the 15th century. But the 15th century, uh, 21st century, also looks like the 20, uh, 15th century. Why? Because I wanted to show that all those uh, spiritual elements, the mystical elements that were in the 15th century are also here in the 21st century, but we have to look for it. So we had a mystical mountain there. That mountain is supposed to be that very famous mountain in Johor uh, called uh, Gunung Ledang, but it doesn't look like that. I wanted it to look like this because it represented exactly Adam's speak in Sri Lanka, where I, I had gone up in 1977. And the moment I saw it, I, I had this spiritual feeling coming out from it. So when the boys in the story go up to learn the mystical elements, I wanted it to be in a conical shape because it represents all those hermits and whatever, the yogis who go up to meditate on mountains. So when we talk about myth, <coughs> we think myth is something that never happened. It's not true, it's just fiction. But actually, it is an interaction between humans and the divine. And you can see this element uh, in the traditional performing arts. You know, in Wayang Kulit, shadow play, or Mat Yung, the traditional court dance, they have about 15 to 20 minutes opening where they pay homage to their guru, to their maha guru, and to the prophet, and ultimately to God. In effect, they are saying that this knowledge that we have is not ours. It is something that was learned from uh, a master and that master learned from the other master. So it is not ours. So uh, they are very humble in the way uh, they present their things. Unlike today, where everybody says, I am the guy who did this. I need to be awarded and so on. Of course, they give awards. But always must remember, it is not us. There's something else behind it. So there's a lot of uh, uh, things hidden <coughs> in myth that recurs. And if you have read about 
uh, what has been written by uh, Joseph Campbell and uh, Roland Bathurst and Claude Levi Strauss and all these guys who have been researching, they are talking about the same thing, that all these elements were actually there in mythology and then it evolved, but what is uh, deeply rooted inside is the same thing. It is a guide for us as Socrates or was it Aristotle who said, stories are all about how men should live their lives. So all those characters on screen uh, represent us and the shadows in uh, shadow play also represent us. But you know, in film language, shadows or silhouettes represent the dark side. So you know, in uh, Star Wars, uh, you have many scenes where it's almost like shadow play. The characters are in the shadows. And in the Hollywood cinema, uh, film noir, the characters are, you do not know who is the good guy, who is the bad guy. Everybody seems to be very negative. And uh, uh, in art also, chiaroscuro lighting, and in German expressionism, uh, uh, you know, uh, all these things are actually talking about that hidden aspect of us which Carl Jung talked about, the shadow archetype. So, uh, this guy, was his name? Mark Kuban. You know, in the 80s, Alvin Toffler and John Nesbitt talked about how digital technology was going to transform the way we work, the way we play, the way we learn. So today, Mark Coburn and uh, Alan, Alan Musk are saying that we are going now on the next level. And what is that? So here's something very interesting. In 10 years, a liberal arts degree in philosophy will probably be worth more. Why philosophy? Philosophy is about going deeper into your subject. It's about the thinking process. Edward de Bono, the psychologist, said, the purpose of thinking is to avoid thinking, which means you do your thinking first uh, before you actually put, uh, go to you know, you know, hands-on. And once you are hands-on, you don't have to think anymore. You, just, you already have that template, just follow. So they say, plan your work, work your plan. That's what we do in firm. But now the next level is to go into more into the thinking process because the technology has made it so easy for us that maybe in the future we just wear this helmet, we just think about what we want and it comes out on the screen. Who knows? <clears throat> so uh, the next step is about aesthetics and experimentation in animation. So we have to move from the representational. That means using the 3D software, uh, making characters look like human beings and so on. And then we have to move from Western art to local art. And this is very much lacking. So I've been teaching in um, uh, almost every university in Malaysia from 1976 and also in many countries. And I find, and I'm also a syllabus moderator, eh? and I tell them that we need to make the change. But the next year, when I come in again, I don't see any changes. There's, it's still about software, it's about technique, and so on, but they are not breaking boundaries. So, uh, teaching of art history also has to change. You don't need to teach art history as it is being taught now. Nobody remembers. So, we need to teach applied art history. So, awareness and emphasis has so far been towards history of Western art, which I've been noticing. And we need to shift and take it to the next level. And with cutting-edge technology, we have to guide students and professionals so that they can break all these rules and conventions that we already have and have our films being shown in international film festivals and so on. Now, I have curated for the Stuttgart International Animation Festival and for the film festival Kekskemet in uh, Hungary and also for NTU in Singapore. And every time, I find it very difficult to get the right kind of films to show. So ultimately, I have to fall back on some student works. Uh, because, you know, students, they do a little bit of research and so on. Eh? Not everyone, maybe one out of ten. So that's what I, 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 I had to show. So for animation teaching and for final year student projects, uh, we should rethink so that we bring our students to another level of thinking so that when they start to work, they can come up with new ideas and help the company to grow and also some, uh, bring some kind of an identity to what we, will, we call Malaysian animation. So the history of art is found in cinema. But not many people know this. Why even teaching film in Malaysia is not on the right track? Except maybe I noticed in one 
university in uh, Johor where I gave a talk recently. So for Malaysian animation to be less isolated, that means we are now actually very isolated. We are not into world animation. So animation and film studies need to open up to the history of art. So I'm going to uh, expand on that. Eh? And art history also cannot avoid film. So when you teach art history, not for animation or whatever, as art history, you need to bring film into the picture. Uh, I don't know if you have seen uh, La La Land, uh, Greatest Showman, and so on. Eh? You can see how they refer to uh, paintings of, uh, from the 18th and 19th century. So uh, the traditional performing arts is something that we need to really, really go into. Now, uh, I, uh, uh, my favorite director of all time is a Japanese director called Yoji Yamada. So in 2015, uh, when I was in Japan, I went to see him. At the age of 83, he was about to shoot his next film. And he told me that uh, Manuel Oliveira, a very famous Portuguese uh, filmmaker, asked him a question. What is this one weapon that we have that we can fight Hollywood with? And Yamada said he didn't know. And Oliveira told him, it is your traditional performing arts. That's where it all is. American, Americans began with vaudeville and burlesque and so on. They do not have that tradition of uh, village art, uh, village theater, oral storytelling, and so on, as they had in Iran, India, and in the East. So for us, the shadow play, for me, is the roots of Malaysian cinema. And I mentioned this in both my books on Malaysian cinema, as well as animation history. And also in the article that I wrote for Indiana University Press, that was published last year, Early Cinema in Asia. So shadow play is acknowledged by UNESCO as one of the intangible something heritage of mankind. And uh, it is the earliest example of cinema. Why? Because it has a screen, it has moving images, it has the voice of the dalang, the puppeteer, it has music. And it is one up on silent cinema because the music is coming from the screen. Whereas in the early uh, silent cinema days, you saw someone playing the piano. So it is true cinema, except that it's in real time. Now, if you look at it uh, like this, you can see the element of the Gothic. So long before it came out from Russia, uh, German expressionism uh, from Germany and so on, we already had the Gothic. And there's a lot of theory behind it, which the shadow play master cannot tell you because he also does not understand. He just does what he does. But today, because of uh, Western philosophy and Western theorists, we are able to talk about what is behind the whole thing. And there was a, there's a very good book written by D.A. Rinkers uh, about um, the Wali Songo, the Nine Saints of Java, eh, where I finally discovered what it was all about. So there's an explanation about characters. Eh? So the puppeteer, represents God himself. And the shadows are human beings. And the screen is heaven. So the shadows cannot, uh, the puppet cannot move on its own accord. It is the puppeteer. In film, Ilya Kazan, who is a director's, uh, actor's director, when he saw something happening from the actor, he let the actor go on. It was not in the script east of Eden, on the waterfront, and so on. And then we began to see a new kind of acting coming out. So the 50s were very, uh, very interesting because we saw new movements, new ways of uh, acting, new ways of directing starting to come out. And if we understand this aspect of it, we can connect it to animation because animation, acting is also involved. So uh, this is my article in this book, which was published last year. I go deeper into, into the subject. <clears throat> And um, Lotte Reiniger from Germany in 1956, she, she made the world's first animated feature film. It was not Snow White. Snow White came in 1937. So this was a silent movie. It was based on uh, one of the stories in the traditional, uh, what was that, The 1001 Nights. And she was inspired by a Chinese shadow play. And she came out with this wonderful film uh, using 
light from the bottom. The camera is up here. And it was moving cutouts on the table. Can you imagine the, you know, how, uh, how she, would have, she had done this with so many characters and wow, I, do, I don't think I could ever do this. And uh, Nina Pelli uh, also was inspired by uh, pu Puppetry, uh, the shadow play. And she made this PC animated film, Sita Sings the Blues, based on her own experience. She had uh, some kind of a horrible time with her partner. And uh, she referred to Indian animation, uh, Indian shadow play. But in India, the shadow play is not like Malaysian. Eh? They are huge. And one person carries one. And they run across the street behind the screen. Now, in uh, our shadow play, these are the, basically the, uh, the, the major characters. Eh? Uh, Siti Devi or Sita Devi, uh, the heroine, Sri Rama, the hero, uh, Ravana, the villain, and uh, Wat Dogol, the jester. So, they represent the archetypes of the hero, the heroine, and so on. And uh, you can see in the design of the characters, uh, you can see the binary opposites. So, very easily understood by the common people. See, uh, Darth Vader, uh, Darth Vader, not Darth Vader, uh, Ravana. So, Ravana is a uh, dark black and you know, in uh, Star Wars, he has himself totally cloaked, we cannot see his face. And uh, he's holding the lightsaber, isn't he? And then, uh, can you recognize all those characters? Exactly the same characters. So, Joseph Campbell wrote a very good book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, about how the hero uh, resurfaces through all time, but with different names. So, this is why it's quite easy to write a story, because there are only a certain number of characters uh, the way they behave, you are either the good guy or you are the bad guy. But when stories evolved and we went into the postmodern, now we do not know who is the good guy and who is the bad guy. Sometimes the good guy does bad things, the bad guy does good things. So we had an anti-hero. So that's clean his wood. When his eyes get very small, he starts to uh, bring out his gun. He shoots first and then will ask you, are you the bad guy? So now we have the trickster hero, Iron Man. He goes against everybody. And uh, in some of the short films uh, and the feature film, this is mine, the one that I directed, I paid homage to uh, Shadow Play as the precursor of cinema. So these are, uh, these are the first ever short film done by a student using the Shadow Play characters uh, and the batik as the background. So this was very unusual. And what is even more unusual is, he was learning animation in Poland. So normally what I would see is, uh, robots, superheroes, aliens and whatever, in their final year project. But here's a guy who was studying in Europe, but he came back to Malaysia. I didn't know him, so he managed to get a hold of me. And I introduced him to a, uh, one of my students who wrote the script. And he went around looking at local designs and so on. And he came out with something that looks very Malaysian even though this is a bit Indonesian. <clears throat> then uh, a lecturer from UITM did one for her master's project, which I'm going to show you, uh, show the clip. And uh, in MMU, uh, University Multimedia, uh, India, Indonesian student together with Malaysian students came out with a short film based on an Indonesian folktale. And you can see the elements of the shadow play there. And a local studio called Glue Studio uh, made a short film, and in one scene, they have the silhouette scene, homage to shadow play. Now, in Thailand, a friend of mine, uh, Payut Ngao Krachang, who has since died, made Thailand's first animated feature film. It took him years and years and years, but his references were also the shadow play called Nang Talung in uh, Thailand. And the second film to be made, and it's the first uh, 3D feature, also made by a friend of mine called Kompin Kem Gumnet, who was, had been working with Disney, and he made a film called Han Kloi, The Blue Elephant, based on a, on a book. And this was bought, uh, this was sold in DVD in the US, and also dubbed into Hindi, shown in, in India. So, this uh, Hanuman drawing was done by Payut Ngao Krachang in the early days. You can see how different it is from the Indian Hanuman, very uh, Thai. And if you look at the wines in the film, Han Kloi, uh, hanging down from the trees, they are very, very Thai in design. 
Compared to our feature film, the first 3D, uh, gang pengembaraan bermula, the jungle was a jungle. The jungle as we know. But here is a jungle that was actually modified uh, for the animation medium. And that's how it should be. Oh, why am I going backward? Oh, okay. So this is a Singapore film based on the uh, 12 animals in the zodiac, the Chinese zodiac. And uh, Indonesia made one called Ceritera, uh, which was a short story, uh, three stories. One of them was on uh, Borneo uh, natives. <coughs> and uh, this one is uh, Haywalk in Heaven from China, which was based on Chinese opera, the designs. And then uh, Urdu, uh, Urduya, Urduya, I don't know how you pronounce this. Uh, in the Philippines was based on a 13th century warrior princess, but very, very Pocahontas-like. In fact, the story is very much like uh, Pocahontas. And then here's uh, my good friend. Ah, there is Eugene Fu. When are we going to see this film? Never. Never. It has been abandoned. But if it had been completed, it would have been mind-blowing totally different from all the films that have been done. Beautiful designs by Eugene, who is a lecturer at Utah now. Unfortunately, something happened and uh, it's been abandoned. So I'm going to show you the four clips made uh, locally based on our local designs. Eh? So let's have a look. Very short, two minutes. <laughs> Singapura di Langgar Toda or Singapore attacked by swordfish, very famous legend. The film language is perfect. This is Ule Mayang, Spirits of the Sea, a song indigenous to Tranganu. It's a story about the hero going on a journey. His ship, uh, his boat capsizes, and he's saved by the spirits of the sea. But what is interesting is at the end, the mystical element comes into into play. Uh, this is from uh, University Multimedia, based on a story called Timun Mas, a very famous story about a girl who has been chased by a giant. Terrible secret. And this is from Glue Studios of the story of Bawang Putih, Bawang Merah. About the evil stepmother, just like uh, Cinderella, isn't it? And the mother becomes a fish. Baon Pute often sought comfort in the forest nearby. Okay, so if you look at the designs. <clears throat> You can see how he has uh, taken those elements, modified them, and uh, made it very, very local. And his film language, you can see, is so good. Uh, look at the trees on top. In a film, watch when the hero is going somewhere and is walking past trees that look like that, it means it's a sign of danger. Why? Because they look like bars. And then, Trees with no leaves, negative. And then running up rather than running down. So that's a problem, isn't it? And then the contrast in lighting. So you have dark and bright. So all these negative elements show that the boy will ultimately be killed by these three people. Now when he came, he looked at our local textiles, our, the batik and so on. And then he was so inspired that he went back, he thought about how he was going to represent the whole thing, and then he came up with that film. And uh, Hajar Aznam of UITM, who did that one, she was also inspired, but inspired by Javanese uh, uh, shadow play. And then she had this very nice movement of, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, waves and so on, and then had all the other elements, the spirits coming in, added a story where uh, one of the spirits falls in love with the hero. 
but ultimately they have to separate. And at the end, we go to the uh, shadow play itself, and then everything comes together. That from many, the many ultimately become one. So that was very clever. And uh, in Timun Mas, you can see how the traditional uh, design elements in Java are brought <coughs> to the screen. So the next stage for Malaysian animation is we already know the rules. We have already mastered the software. We know the technique of animation and so on. So now we have to break the rules and we have to go into the abstract, the surrealist, the expressionist and the experimental. Oops. Now there's one student, uh, Sokui Teng, who is a lecturer now from University Multimedia. So far I've seen she's the only one who referred to Western art to tell her story for a final year project. It's called The Flower of Huernica. And it was based on Picasso's famous painting uh, with his anti-war sentiment. Uh, that's the one in black and white. So she did a 3D and rendered as 2D. Uh, uh, not rendered, I don't know, not rendered as 2D. Eh? It's still 3D, but it looks like 2D. And then she inserted her own feelings about how she felt about war. And she, it was very cinematic. You can see it on YouTube, Flower of Huernica. So I'm going to show you now four short films from around the world. Iran, two from Iran, one from China and UK, about how they referred to traditional art, African, uh, Chinese, uh, Iranian, uh, the, the calligraphy, and also the, the what is that, Iranian religion, the Persian religion. Eh? Um, uh, I forget it for the moment, but you will see it on screen. So this is a final year project by an Iranian student in MMU. And it's about the origin of men based on the Zoroastrian religion. From China, obviously, it looks like a flat two-dimensional painting. But then, this was done more than 10 years ago. This is a final year PhD project for an Ina Iranian student studying at NTU. So he took the um, Arabic script, animated it manually, and then finished it digitally. And ultimately, it comes to the Kaaba. This is by Erika Russell. It's based on African art. Holding it upside down, no wonder. <laughs> okay, so the world has gone very far. So if you look at the foreign students studying in Malaysia, this is the kind of thing they are coming up with. But we are still into 
represent the representational, uh, doing characters in 3D and so on. Why? It's easier to do or there's no, not much thinking behind it. So we need to go beyond that. <clears throat> so this uh, student, uh, he took the Arabic script and then he animated it. It was supposed to be a 2D, uh, hand-drawn thing. I don't know how he did it, but it's really, really incredible. And Erika Russell, she has done a couple of films based on African art. And you can see how she took the African art and transformed it to something that was very cinematic. So in Asia, you can find there's so much design elements, not only in art, but even in the religious iconography. Look at that. They're basically the same, the Indonesian art, that man and nature are one and the same. So ultimately, that is the truth. But we are still in the dualism mode. And this is my friend, uh, comic and animator, comics artist and animator, uh, Elfie Zakariel, uh, who has done some really, really wonderful work, which is perfect for animation. And uh, in Japan, is it any wonder that we all love anime and manga? Look at their traditional art of uh, the Hiroshige, uh, what's the other guy? Hiroshige Otamaro and somebody else. There are three very famous ones. See their designs? And I was very much inspired by the paintings of, uh, in the films of Hayao Miyazaki. So I met Miyazaki at his studio in 1997 and he said, please look around, we have nothing to hide. We have no secrets. How can you copy Miyazaki? So when I told my student, everybody went, ah. So I said, this hand shook Miyazaki's hand. So all of you line up and kiss my hand. <laughs> so uh, Kazuo Oga, a very famous artist in uh, Japan, was the one who was contracted to come up with the uh, concept art and the artist followed his style. So when I saw uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, when I, uh, they gave me a, a book of uh, Oga, uh, Kazuo Oga's paintings and I gave that to the background designers for uh, following the same style, especially the clouds in the sky. So Miyazaki's films are very famous for his clouds. So incredible, can you imagine? And the place I wanted to visit was where the backgrounds were being painted. Because I myself used to paint backgrounds. So of course I wanted to know how they do it. Actually they are very small, they are not very big. So we have to look at our own design, our own painting, look at our own artists and be inspired by them for our backgrounds and for our character designs. So you see how uh, Muslims could not do representational drawings of human beings, figure, figure drawings and so on. Eh? So they came up with all these ideas. See, you still can see a tiger or a swan and so on, eh? but actually it's the Arabic script. And look at, look at this uh, batik design, so beautifully done. When there are exhibitions, I hardly see lecturers or students coming. This is uh, by a local uh, Chinese artist who is now in Singapore. See, perfect for animation. Uh, these are drawings that I saw in the bookshop on the cover of diaries, I think. So I surreptitiously photographed them without them seeing me. Look at that. And of course, uh, Datuk Syed Ahmad Jamal and his wonderful <coughs> abstract paintings. And uh, perhaps people will ask, how can we animate overweight people? Who said we can't? Mark Baker, a student, won international awards with his film called The Village, and all his characters were overweight. See? The, uh, the Bonio, Bonio art, and of course Yusuf Gajah. I just love his work and he does all these cute uh, elephants that he draws by hand. And Jaffa types paintings. Uh, he's a wonderful artist and uh, cartoonist. And he goes into the jungle with his camera and painting. 
uh, look at this. So if you want to do it in 3D, it's already perfect. And it's, these are his cartoons. And it comes out in the Gila Gila magazine. And it's got all these wonderful jokes of uh, the Sankan Chil and so on. Incidentally, for my second film, I copied his design of Kanchil. The first one that I did was more like Bambi. But the second one, when I saw it, I of course sung up the thing. And if you look at the books uh, of stories and so on, there's so many in Malaysia that are being published from time to time. And even on the covers itself, you can see how you can adapt some of these characters, uh, character designs. Okay, art history in cinema. So, have you heard of Michelangelo Antonioni? Very famous Italian director. He's not the, one of the Ninja Turtles. And uh, his favorite artist was Caravaggio. So, he, uh, somebody said that his cinema is characterized by a dualism of mind and body, separated instead of being one. In Asia, uh, remember the film called What's New Pussycat? Peter Sellers is acting as an Indian and somebody tells him, Sir, who do you think you are? And he just rolls his head, Sir, in India, we don't think who we are, we know who we are. <laughs> so in the West, they had problem. So mind and body is separated. So it was a cinema of, of the body, if you look at his films, huh? with the weight of the past, the tiredness of the world, and modern neurosis. So this is what we see in his characters. Then the cinema of the brain. Creativity of the brain is colors aroused by new space-time, its powers aroused by artificial brains. Uh, I, I don't pretend to understand what this means, but I think in a sense, this echoes what uh, Mark Cuban was saying about the future with digital technology. So this is Caravaggio, some of Caravaggio's paintings. There was a wonderful exhibition which ended last month in the National Art Gallery. I don't know if you went to see. It was not the original painting. They were digital printout, but they were so beautiful. They looked like the original. Why? Because this guy paints, and he's called the master of light. The skin glows with light. I don't know how he does it. <clears throat> Look at that. And, of course, cinematographers, they refer to his paintings for lighting. This is uh, Vermeer, and there was a film made on this uh, painting, The Girl with the Earrings, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, look at the way he handles lighting. Now, that one is a still from the film Barry Lyndon, directed by Stanley Kubrick. So they created special lens to be able to shoot with daylight and light coming from candles to get the look that Vermeer had in his paintings. Crazy people. And uh, Edward Hopper, an American in the 1940s, he did all this painting, and his famous one is The Night Hawk. And then when Hollywood made a film called Panis from Heaven, they copied exactly. And then uh, Woody Allen Manhattan, that scene was based on Edward Hopper's painting. And uh, in Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock, the house was modeled after Edward Hopper's painting. And American Graffiti, the inspiration, came from Edward Hopper again. And in Skyfall, the James Bond movie, uh, there's a scene where the James Bond is sitting with, what's his name, M, I think, uh, in an art gallery, and they're looking at a painting by J.M.W. Turner, is it? And that's one of the paintings. And the scene at the end, the climatic scene where the church, I think, gets blown up, I think. See? All inspired by art. And of course, how can we leave out Rembrandt? So look at Rembrandt's painting and the way he uses the background. The background is very dark and then we even see the face going into the shadows. And in Malaysia, you might be surprised. You know from which film this comes from? Hantu Kat Lima Balik Ke Rumah. So don't play the fool with Mamat Khalid. He knows art. He refers to cinema history and art history. And from Johnny Bikin film, from one of my mentors, Dr. Anwar No Arai. And that's from Kala Malam Bula Mengambang, Mamat Khalid's uh, uh, film, which was modeled after uh, uh, the Gothic elements uh, and also film noir. 
Incidentally, this guy is uh, Sophie Jikan, one of my students from Academy Film Malaysia. So mainstream cinema has been blurring the distinction or the boundaries between high art and popular culture. So more and more, they are referring to all this painting and so on, but we, the audience, don't really have to know. But if you know, it enhances your viewing pleasure. So in production design and art direction, this is where everything happens, together with the director. So the production designer is someone who knows art. Uh, my friend Yasu Tanaka, a Japanese who are working in Malaysia, he directed a film called Nota. He said that when the cinematographer from Germany came to see him, he had a book of paintings. And he wanted the director to tell, to tell him, what kind of look do you have in your mind that your film looks like? That is, the, is his reference for the cinematography. And it's one of the really well photographed films of Malaysia. So uh, production design and art direction is an integral element of cinema. You cannot do without it. So images are borrowed from art history that inflect or give meaning to the narrative. They are not just there as backgrounds. And of course, Disney, this is uh, uh, mostly from uh, Fantasia, made in the 1941 or 49. There's an entire book written on the influences from European art for the, for the film. That's from uh, uh, Cinderella, also influenced by European art. So animation studies today needs to open up to the history and development of art to be able to tell stories effectively, visually. And art history cannot avoid film. Film cannot avoid art, art history. But we have to teach applied art history not art history as it has been done for so long. So, people say that if you have your own stories, your traditional stories, you cannot make it overseas. Why? People want to see something that they are familiar with and so on. But people always say, live in a small pond, but have a global outlook. So therefore, we can still look to Western art for inspiration, but we can tie that to, with our local... Uh, uh, what do you call uh, art? And as you can see, Latte Mohidin's uh, paintings here, you can see uh, some influences from Western art. So, Malaysian animation and its aesthetics. At the moment, it is an isolated field, separate from world animation. So, I am hoping for our animation filmmakers, not animators, eh, animation filmmakers, and academia to be a bit more enlightened. But do you think, I believe that it can happen? <laughs> I'm very cynical. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hassan, for such an enjoyable and interesting talk. Um, we're now doing a Q&A session, so you can just raise your hand if you have any questions, and then I'll pass the mic to you. I think they need to collect their thoughts first. Hi, thank you. Assalamualaikum, uh, Pak Hassan. I'm Nikki from MMU. Uh, I am in academia. So um, I, I will put up the question, where do you think or what is the gap that you see in academia? Because um, you mentioned about we are not there. So where do we go? Where do we start? And what can we do? Um, you are quite familiar with our syllabus. Uh, we've invited you um, so you know where we are and um, where you think we need that um, support and in what sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so from the 70s, I was already talking uh, about many things. I discovered animation. I was so excited by it. And I was... Uh, I had the best of two worlds, uh, classical animation and independent animation. So when I was in Film Negara, it's a government uh, documentary film studio, I was only a titling artist. Then suddenly in 1972, I was asked to make, do animation. I said, no problem. So what did I do? I always copy. <clears throat> so I was not trained in art, I was not trained in animation, so I copied. 
And guess who I was copying? I was copying the masters. How can you fail if you're copying the masters? So in our library, we had all these films from the National Film Board of Canada. And, and you know, the irony of it was, I was studying the films of Ishu Patel, who was an Academy Award winner uh, for his short films called, like Paradise, How Death Came to the Earth, and so on. In 20, 2012, I was invited to Nanyang Technological University as a visiting scholar. Can you imagine? I was given a title of professor. And uh, guess whose students, uh, whose professors, students that I was, um, what do you call, uh, commenting on? Ishu Patel students. Can you imagine? We were colleagues. So when I told him that I was studying his film, he was so happy. <clears throat> uh, at the same time, I was also borrowing films, uh, the Disneyland films, uh, no, the Disneyland show from RTM. They were on 16 millimeter. So you know 16 millimeter is very, very small. Eh? So I had to use a magnifying glass, look at it like this, with the light from underneath. And I was copying all these walk cycles, the smoke effects, uh, lightning, and I applied that in the uh, public service advertisements that I was doing. So in the 70s and 80s, Film Negara became famous for animation and not for documentary films. Because nobody had seen anything like it. Nobody had done anything. So I began to be more and more interested. Then I began to discover the hard way, not like the academics, huh? study, study, study. I was also studying, but it was all practical for me. So I began to find out that there's a way to do classical animation, but using the indie approach, not much drawings are required. And I was very lucky at that time, there was an Australian animator who was uh, stationed in Film Negara to do the uh, commercial called Seasons Paint. And then suddenly he left, leaving behind all his artwork. And guess who is the one who pounced on those drawings? So I look, had a look at it, and I was so amazed. He drew a bird flying. So normally a bird would fly like this. But his drawings, one was like this, the next one was like this, the next one was like this, the next one was like this. There was no in-between. In-between means uh, when one is like this, when is one like this, you need to add something here so that it's a bit more smooth, isn't it? He didn't care. But when I photographed it, and I looked at it, I couldn't believe it. So if you look at Sankanchil dan uh, Boyer, eh, you will notice that the Boyer is walking, and normally we don't go more than two frames per drawing, but I use three frames per drawing. So there is actually a trick to doing things. So all these things built up, and I was teaching it, but people couldn't get it because they did not go the road that I had taken. So from time to time, when I gave lectures and so on, and I even gave uh, a training, the trainers program in Singapore also, uh, you can only do so much. If they do not go further by reading books, looking at films, analyzing and so on, what I have said will not mean anything to them. So we need to have proper training the trainers program for our lecturers. Because now almost every university and college is teaching animation, multimedia and film. And all of this is coming together. So with the incredible advances in software, uh, now they are doing 3D animation and you cannot differentiate it from live action. Okay? So all the more reason for us to really go deeper into the subject. You really have to understand film dynamics. I hope you understand what is film dynamics. Everything got to come together in a certain manner. So many people doing in different departments. They all have to got to come together. And it is the director who decides whether you go this way or whether you go that way, whether it works or not. Sometimes you don't have a lot of animation. Just very limited animation will be good enough. Sometimes you need very fluid animation. Who decides? It's not the animator. The animator just does his job. It's the director. So that's why directors are actually thinkers. They are philosophers. 
these are the people that you should train, eh? and we should do it like the way they train at the Beijing Film Academy. In Beijing Film Academy, they teach philosophy and music and literature. And my friend who studied in Poland, I asked him, how do they teach animation in Poland? He said, in the first year, they don't teach you animation, you have to learn it yourself. But they teach four subjects, literature, theater, music, and philosophy. And that's why Singapura di Langar Toda came out like that. If you analyze the entire movie, in its narrative and its film language, it is so different from any film done in Malaysia. So I do not know how to answer that. Uh, uh, in many institutions, academia has lost its way. So I am a syllabus moderator. I'm the only one uh, non-academic who's recognized by MQA. And I tell them this is the way you need to go. But I understand their limitations because it takes too long to set up a pro pro program. And it's all about, you know, they have to make money, isn't it? And, uh, but I know there's one institution that's keeping up. Uh, <clears throat> every year, they make changes. And they listen to what I tell them. I say, my, one of my friends is the art director for Mulan. He's now in Singapore. Do you want to bring him over? They say, yes. And so he came, Hans Bacher. And you know, he did Mulan, eh? and his uh, painting was in the style of Chinese animation. He adapted himself. But of course, it's not real, really a Chinese, a Chinese style. Uh, the Chinese look at it, they laugh. So it's good. I don't know what can be done. Lah. So it, it's happening, but very, very slowly, too slowly. Unless I become a vice chancellor. Ken? Hi, I'm Amy. I'm, I'm late, I'm sorry. But uh, the point you raised just a moment ago was very, very crucial. I myself am also self-taught and I'm also teaching in colleges now. And I believe that what you said about the education system being too um, pointed that means if you study animation, they teach you techniques about animation, but they don't think you'd about the process of thinking on a wider scope. I think that is a very big problem. Back during the Bauhaus era, uh, era they actually taught everything. They don't teach, they don't say that if you want to be a sculptor, you learn sculpting. They teach everything, and then you decide which path you want. So how can we change the Malaysian syllabus <laughs> in some ways to actually correct the path. Instead of having graphic designers graduate, you have artists and then they take their path however they want to go. Thank you. Uh, I developed a methodology without knowing I had developed it uh, from the 70s. Because we used to have people come attached to Film Negara to come and learn animation. And they were just teachers. But every one of them will end up making a short film. The quality won't be there because we had only a few days, but they understood the process. Uh, based on my experience in India, <clears throat> uh, I can tell you that there's a way to get it done. So I went to India under UNESCO uh, twice. They had a five-year educational program where they brought all these designers from all over India to New Delhi. And then I had to, uh, we had two groups. One group was about population, communication, and development. Uh, the other group had to produce something based on the research that they had done. So in my group, <clears throat> we had all these designers. They had never done, I don't know, they, they had learned animation. So it seemed they had brought people from BBC, from Australia, and so on, but nothing happened. But in four weeks, we made four films, four short films. And one of the films was good enough, it was shown on national television. I didn't know until a year later they told me. Uh, I said, let's choose a subject that I wouldn't know anything about because I, will, I want to prove that all of you can become animators. So right from the developing of the idea to the story to uh, coming up with a song 
and they themselves sang the song and they voiced it and um, they were the animators, they were the character designers, they were the writers. So we went through the whole thing from beginning until the end, script to screen. So if they went back, if they repeated that process, they could easily do it. And after that, they just needed the experience. Now I tell the universities that the first two weeks are the most crucial when students come in for study. They, of course, they have orientation, eh? but my orientation is very different. <clears throat> you have to find out why, why the student is there. Why did you come here and not go for the cooking class? See, young students today eh, are being forced by their parents. You must get the degree so that you can get this high-paying job. That's not the way to go. We have to go back to the old way of study, which is being an apprentice. So the Western method is, I show you how to do something, then you do it, and I will tell you whether you are doing it correctly or not, and then I will give you the marks. The Eastern way is, you follow me, you see the way I catch fish, and if you don't catch fish, too bad for you, you don't eat tonight. How do you think the painters of old, like Van Gogh, Rembrandt, and all this, they were apprentices to artists. But why is it that their art became different and they became more famous than their masters? There is something called spiritual knowledge. I studied under very, very old masters. I studied mysticism, but we don't study. The master doesn't teach. The master guides. My master can read your mind. He knows the past. He knows the future. You don't question the master, which is, of course, anathema to Western education. And even after he is dead, so I better don't tell you about this, lah. otherwise you won't go. <laughs> so there's another way of learning, but let's make it academic. There are four ways of learning. From a teacher, from trial and error, from copying, and then from thinking. Not many people would like to learn formally from a master. They fall asleep. I was one of them, like that. So trial and error is some people would like to do something with their hands. And then finally, maybe they succeed in understanding how to do things. And copying. By seeing how other people do things, it may work for you. If it doesn't work, at least now you have some experience that this is not the way to go. That's why Disney said, not only is it important to know what to do, but also what not to do. So experience is the word, is the name we give to all the mistakes that we make. And I made a hell of a lot of mistakes. So my way is quite effective, but it takes a little long, roughly about 20 years. So we have no time, isn't it? <laughs> Must get a job quick. So you have to, uh, the other one is thinking. Some people are thinkers. Just like Mat Sentol, eh? Malaysia's first feature film animator. He was a thinker. He didn't talk very much. Then he would doodle and so on, and then he's able to do things. So when you have an orientation, you have to find which one of these four is the student more to. And there are ways to... There's a test that I give, and I all, all tell... Uh, in my class, there are lecturers. And I start out by telling them, all of you are going to fail my test. And of course, they get very upset because some of them are PhDs. And they fail my test. So I give an example. I tell them, draw a stick figure running in three different panels, like a storyboard panel. Eh? So of course, they all start drawing. So I go around, I know all of them fail. So, after finishing, I project one, <clears throat> and then I ask everyone, tell me why is this man running? All go blank. So, if I'm an actor, actually I'm an actor, I've acted in four feature films, five feature films, two TV dramas, many short films. I don't like to act, but I act because as an animator, you need to know how to act. That's one of the big lacking things lacking 
in teaching animation. They don't understand how to teach acting. It has to be very visual. Even in normal script writing classes, after you have written a dialogue, some dialogue, you have to get two professional actors to come in and then read the dialogue. And then you see the problem. The actors can't do it. They say, this is horrible dialogue. We don't believe this. So they have to rewrite the dialogue. You know, in literature, you have rhyme, you have alliteration. For the good guy, and for positive times, there needs to be rhyme and alliteration. But when they are in serious trouble, and there's a lot of drama and so on, it cannot be the same kind of dialogue writing. But I don't see anybody teaching this. I'm sure you remember uh, Julius Caesar, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Brutus goes up on stage and speaks. Then Mark Antony goes up on stage and speaks. In the end, what happens? Brutus convinced the people that Caesar must die. And Mark Antony went up. He started to praise Brutus and the gang. And then what happened? The dialogue writing is incredible. Brutus went up and said, friends, Romans, lovers. So of course, the slight clapping. They understand Romans, uh, friends, Romans. Lovers, a bit difficult. Huh? It's high-level language. Because Brutus is an aristocrat. But Mark Antony knew his audience. And he said, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. See, when he said countrymen, everybody clapped. He is one of them. The evil that men do lives after them. Their good is off interred in their bones. So let it be with Caesar. Of course, he went up there and said, uh, you did not come to bury Caesar. I come here not to praise Caesar, but to bury him. That's his first thing. And everybody said, yes, Caesar is a nasty guy. He must die. But he actually came to bury Brutus and Cassius and the king. But how did he start? In film writing, there is a way to start your story. And Hollywood uses something called six story beats. Exposition, then you have inciting incident, then you have uh, uh, complications, a rising complications, a crisis, and a resolution. They never deviate from this. And it has to be very visual. Who is teaching all this? No. Just like art history, they're teaching everything from the primitive art until uh, modern art, which nobody understands. You don't have to do that. Same thing for animation, you don't have to teach script writing. You have to teach story development and character development. And that was what I was teaching in a certain institution. And they paid me more than the other lecturers. Why? Because they knew this was lacking. So what to do? Same problem, like what Nikki said just now. How do we get acad academia to understand all this? So maybe I must have DR in front of my name. <laughs> or maybe become a vice chancellor of all the universities. Um, okay, la. <laughs> okay, I think we have um, time for one last question. Yeah, what's the answer to the stickman problem? The, she wants to know, like, what's the the answer to this your stickman test? Answer what? The stickman. You asked ah, you. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> I forgot to mention the stickman. <laughs> As an actor. If you ask me to run, I, oh, did I tell you that uh, draw a stick man running? The idea was not uh, to see their, what you call, quality of art, no. It was the quality of their thinking. So everybody, I said, draw a stick man running in three minutes. So they had long shot, medium shot, close up, high angle, low angle. They were not thinking. They just drew a man running. So I asked the guy, why is the man running? He was blank. There were a few guys. There's one guy from Egypt, very crazy fellow. 
That's why he was able to be creative. He drew a man running, wearing short pants, wearing a T-shirt, and holding a torch. That year, the year 2000, was the Olympics. He thought for himself. But if anybody had asked me, why is the man running, then finish. I would have to say why he was running. Now, only when you know why the man is running, would you be able to draw him either running very fast or very slow. If you ask an actor to run, he will ask, why am I running? What's my motivation? But if you're the nasty director, shut up and run. <laughs> Even walking, if you ask someone to walk, why am I walking? So if he says, you just got a call, your father was seriously ill in the village, and you are 300 miles away, I just want you to walk. It'll be different, isn't it? Okay, your girlfriend just said she accepts your proposal. How would he walk? <laughs> we got all this being taught in our universities. So, uh, another guy, he drew a long line, and then he had a guy running. What is that? 100 meters. I didn't tell him. He thought for himself. So that is the thing that is missing. So the purpose of thinking is to avoid thinking. So do your thinking first, so that when you are animating, no need to think anymore. It's all there. I also, also give another test, acting test. And this test was given by Lionel Barrymore, if I'm not mistaken, the very famous actor. He went to see someone, another famous actor. He said, how do you audition someone to see whether he is a good actor or not? He said, this is what I will do. I will hide a pin in my tab on my table. And when the guy comes in, I'll ask him, to look for the pin. So how do you know that he's a good actor or not? The bad actor will be, you know, posing and he'll be looking, acting, looking for the pin. But the real actor will actually look for the pin by picking up the paper and in his head, I, am, I have to find this pin. But the other guy is acting, looking for a pin. So that's how you can tell. And I used to give all these sessions in my animation class. I'll get the student themselves to, uh, to do it. Okay, I think that's all we have time for. But if you have any other questions, you can talk to Hassan after uh, the talk. And please buy my book and make me rich today. Yes, please buy his book. <laughs> the first um, history of animation in Malaysia. Um, please join me in uh, giving another round of applause to Hassan Abdul Talib. <laughs>